We'd like to welcome you for another edition here of our digital devotionals. And my name is Steve Jewell. I'm the pastor at Trinity Presbyterian Church. And we're so glad to have you with us as we study the Word of God together. And as always, I'm I'm hopeful and eager that these would be uh, something that God would use as a blessing in your life to, to strengthen you in your knowledge of Scripture and that would stir in you a greater love for Jesus and certainly would inspire you to, to live that out in the way we love and minister grace and kindness uh, and, and the heaven, uh, the glories of heaven to our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones. And so uh, what, a, what a joy it is to be able to be together like this this morning. Now, we have been studying in a, a booklet here that we put together as a church, uh, different scriptures through Lent that we're studying, and each week has a theme. And uh, perhaps you noticed last week, if you joined us, that the theme is that of prayer. Now, this week, the, the theme is primarily going to be about the, the topic or themes of humility and justification. Now, justification, don't be scared with that word. That is a, a word that I hope to offer a, a definition to in this video, perhaps even uh, reinforce later on in our week together. Uh, but listen for that. But this morning, to kind of kick off our study time together, uh, I invite you to grab your Bible and turn uh, with me to the Gospel of Luke. If you want to follow along together, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 18, verses 9 through 17. And so uh, let, let's hear the Word of God together. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went down to went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now they were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him saying, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now there's... A lot going on in this passage, and, and to kind of kick off here, you know, there's there's kind of a pervasive idea, and, and it may be overt in our lives, or maybe it's very subtle, but, but the idea kind of goes along like this. I work. I earn my paycheck. I put food on the table. I put clothes on our back. I put a roof over our head. Now, these are just the beginnings of what literally could be thousands upon thousands of self-dependent, self-assertive, self-glorifying I statements that we make. And, and it's very subtle. And all of us struggle with this. But unfortunately, too few of us break through the thin veil of this self-reliance. And I have to tell you, our, our sense of self-reliance is probably one of the greatest sources of not only frustration, but despair that we run into. Now, thankfully, Jesus is not a tiptoer. He doesn't dance around issues. Jesus tends to be bold. He tends to be blunt. And he also is incisive when it comes to exposing who we really are as well as who he can make us become fully when we trust him first, when we trust him alone, and when we trust him always. 
Now, the overarching theme in this passage, these two things, this parable and this encounter with children, uh, it, 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 it deals with tension between self-dependence and Savior dependence. Now, to do this, Jesus does two things. First, he corrects a falsehood, and second, he confronts a failure. Now, this is going to take a little bit of time, and, and I hope we can follow along here, but, but first, Jesus, in verses 9 through 14, is going to uh, correct a falsehood. Now, the falsehood is stated right there at the beginning of verse 9 when he says he told a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and thereby treated others with contempt. The whole point of this parable that Jesus tells is to correct the deadly air of self-dependence and self-trust. See, false beliefs always lead to false behaviors and in the end to an eternally false confidence and conduct. And so we're introduced to two people here, uh, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector, and each of them represents two possible postures before God. And you notice the, the Pharisee, when he prays, he, he stands up and, and he's, he's in a posture of, of importance, and, and he, has, he operates and he prays with an elevated view of himself. I mean, look at, look at what he prays, the kind of things that he says. He says, I thank you. I'm not like other people. The implication is I'm special. I'm special because I'm me. And so he has this elevated view where I'm not like other people. I don't do all these bad things that other people do. I do the good things. Not only that, I fast twice a week, not just once, but I do it twice, not, not just on the Sabbath, but I do it twice a week. I'm super, super devoted to you. And, and I also give tithes on all I get. And, and he doesn't state it, but the inference is that I deserve special privileges from God because of all that I do. My dependence on me earns me special place and recognition before God. Then you have the tax collector. The tax collector won't even draw near by and close. He stands off afar and he approaches God, not like the, tax, the, the Pharisee who has an, a, an especially high view of himself. The tax collector has a low view of himself, especially when it comes to comparing himself with God. See, the Pharisee compares himself with others. His, his standard of comparison is with others around him. The tax collector's only standard of comparison is God. And before God, he's humble. And in this place of God's presence in the temple, he simply beats his chest, which is a, an act of, of earnestness and sincerity. And he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He doesn't want to parade anything that he somehow thinks that he's achieved or earned. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so two questions each of us need to ask in relation to this first part here when Jesus is con co correcting a falsehood. The first question is, what is my point of reference in life? What reference point do I use to gain a sense of self-understanding about who I am? Is my reference point others? And we can always find others that are lower than ourselves to make us feel and have an elevated sense of ourselves. And so is my point of reference others or is my point of reference God? And in this passage, in this parable, Jesus wants us and is challenging us to have God be our point of reference. And then the second question is, on what or on whom do I depend to be justified? Now, there's the word justified that I want us to kind of parse out for a second. This word justified or justification is a technical term, and it's used to describe, I'm trying to boil it down to, to as simple as possible terms. It's, it's a technical term that's used to describe two realities. First, what it takes to pardon us for our sin, what it takes to remove uh, not only our guilt, but our 
uh, punishment for our sin, for our wrongdoing. And so the first part of justification is that which pardons us for our sin, and thereby the second part restores us again to a right relationship with God. Justification is that which pardons us for our wrong and places us again in a right relationship with God. Well, on what are you depending to have your sin pardoned, and on whom do you depend to have that relationship with God restored? Do you rely on yourself, or do you rely on the gift of God in Jesus Christ? You see, he concludes here in the the last part of verse 14 that self-dependence leads to further separation from God, while Savior dependence leads to increased intimacy and closeness with God. The way the way it is written here in the Gospel Luke is that Jesus says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. That is, if you are proud, you'll be humbled and separated. But everyone who is humbled will be exalted, will be celebrated and received into the loving arms and the widespread glorious kingdom of God. And so that's the first thing Jesus does. First, he corrects a falsehood. And the second thing he does is actually related to correcting the falsehood. He confronts a failure. And and this time, it's not just people outside the circle of his ministry team, his his disciples, but now it's the, the his very disciples that he has to confront. And and most, most as gloriously, it comes in this situation where people are thrilled. Jesus is kind of reaching a rock star status among, among the, the common people. And they're bringing their kids to him. And they just want Jesus to touch their kids and say a blessing over their kids. And so it says in verse 15, people were bringing infants to him. Infants to him. That he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked these parents, these people. They they criticized and they critiqued them. But Jesus, latching on to that, he he calls these these people to himself and he says, No, let the children come. Let them come to me and do not hinder them. And he says this, and this is this is an unequivocal statement. He says, To them belong the kingdom of God. Children. Now, he's not saying that especially to those that are three and under or there's some arbitrary number, but he, he's now saying that in a literal sense, children is pointing to a figurative reality. And, and so childlikeness is a precondition by which we receive the kingdom of God, the way we, we receive Jesus. Childlikeness. Now, a child is, uh, in, in kind of a, a very textbook t- technical sense, a child is a young and helpless one. Now, figuratively, what Jesus is saying is a child is one who is utterly vulnerable. They are absolutely dependent. They are totally trusting, and they are fully assured. Now, by utterly vulnerable, what Jesus is saying is a child uh, they, they cannot tend to their own needs because of their vulnerable state. They, they don't even know what their needs are, and so they're utterly vulnerable. They, they can't cook. They can't uh, you know, plant seeds and harvest. They, they're utterly vulnerable. They, they cannot tend to their own needs, and so a child is utterly vulnerable, but they are also absolutely dependent. A child's vulnerability then makes them dependent upon others to tend to their needs. So they're utterly vulnerable, they're absolutely dependent, and they are totally trusting. A a child, you know, they they may not know they have a need, maybe they do know that they're hungry. They go to mommy, you know, child runs up to you, mommy, I'm hungry. But they don't understand the categories and the priorities of their need. They just know that they're hungry. They just know that they hurt. And, and so they're totally trusting. They go to the ones that they are absolutely dependent upon, and they trust that they are going to care for them. So it's absolute, it's utter vulnerability, absolute dependence, total trust, and then they are fully assured. It's interesting, you know, once a child eats, you know, notice they, they just go off into their land of play and make-believe or, or entertainment or running around or horseplay. You know, they're, they're fine, they're satisfied, they're happy, they're content, they are fully assured. 
See, once a child is cared for, they're not concerned or worried or stressed out about their needs any longer. In a gloriously short-sighted way, a child is simply assured that when they have a need, it will be taken care of. That's what Jesus is getting at here, to receive the kingdom as a child, where we know that in Christ, we are those who are utterly vulnerable, we are absolutely dependent, we are totally trusting, and we are fully assured. Brothers and sisters, that is what this journey toward Lent, uh, of Lent toward Easter is all about. See, that's why God sent his son Jesus for us. And in the midst of our circumstances, in the midst of our daily lives today, I pray, and I'm going to pray in a moment, I pray that each of us would be gripped by Jesus in such a way that we would be Savior-dependent and not self-dependent. Because, see, when we're Savior-dependent, not only are our needs eternally cared for, but we become generous. We become lavish and sacrificial in the way we love and serve other words. That's why, others, that's why believing in Jesus, it changes us. And it changes us in a glorious way so that those that are disciples of Jesus tend to operate for the greatest good of others because we are Savior dependent. So brothers, sisters, may that be what God does in our hearts and in our lives through our study here and by now the work of the Holy Spirit as we pray. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, I do pray that you administer in a very powerful and work in a very powerful way in our hearts and in our minds. In these days of uh, being cooped up in our homes and, and adjusting to uh, these shifts in our society and culture right now, and, and we're having our legs kind of removed out from under us of, of, of self-dependence, and, and I pray, God, that this would be an opportunity whereby you draw us to depend upon you call upon you, trust and depend upon your goodness and your faithfulness in the name of Jesus. And so would you minister that to us? I pray for a real sense of assurance and peace to come over each and every one of us right now in this very moment. Come upon us in your peace and in your presence that it would be you, Jesus, and you alone that we love and we trust and we depend upon not only for the, the, our justification to be pardoned of our sin and restored to a relationship with you, but God, for you to be the one that tends to our daily needs. We love you and we thank you for your love for us, we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much for joining us this morning in this time. I pray that this is a blessing to you. Like it, share it, turn on your notifications, and I look forward to another great word with you tomorrow. So uh, I pray, have a blessed day.